Greetings. The Fulbright Association is pleased to welcome all our attendees today for this Fulbright Forum. The Fulbright Association extends the Fulbright International Exchange into a lifelong experience for U.S. alumni. We connect alumni and friends of the Fulbright program through lifelong learning, collaborative networking, and service trips at home and abroad. Through our 54 local chapters, the Fulbright Association hosts more than 230 regional and national programs each year for visiting Fulbrighters and alumni throughout the United States. This year's programming is particularly special since it is the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright program. Focused on international issues, the Fulbright Forum series features extraordinary speakers from all around the world. Our topic today, Iceland, history, culture, and environment. I'll now hand it over to Dr. Jay Nathan, who will be introducing our speakers for today's forum. This is Jay Nathan, your Fulbright Association National Board Director and Professor at Brooklyn College of Business at St. John's University, New York City, teaching and researching on countries and cultures. My pleasure to welcome all of you to your Fulbright Forum on Iceland. In the summer of 2019, I was part of Fulbright Insight trip to Iceland. After arriving in Reykjavik, we went to the settlement center dating back in 870 AD. Learned a great deal about Egil, an early settler famous for Viking sagas. Then we traveled north and west, staying in places just under the Arctic Circle, Prusavik, Siglisidor, and Akureyri, the capital of North Iceland. It is spectacular to watch and experience sunlight throughout nights and early morning. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Her Excellency Iceland's Ambassador to the United States, Bergdis Ellis Dottir. On September 16, 2019, Ellis Dottir became the 17th Ambassador um, of Iceland to serve in the position. Ambassador Ellis Dottir has had extensive experience serving Iceland's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In 1991, became first secretary in Trade Department. After that, deputy head of mission in Bonn with accreditations to Switzerland, Austria, OSCE, as a political affairs officer at NATO headquarters in Brussels. In 2003, became the deputy director of the political department dealing with security issues, NATO, and bilateral relations with the United States, Canada, and Russia. In 2005, Her Excellency became foreign affairs advisor to prime minister. In 2007, deputy secretary general with the European Free Trade Association in Brussels. From 2014 to 2018, Her Excellency served as head of the Iceland mission to the European Union and also uh, ambassador to Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Switzerland, and San Marino. In 1928, in 2018, she was appointed permanent representative to the United Nations. It gives me a great pleasure and honor to present Her Excellency Berg Dizelis Dottir, Iceland Ambassador to the United States. Thank you so much, Jay, for this uh, extensive uh, introduction. And uh, thank you, Fulbright, for uh, inviting me to speak here today. Uh, I am very honored uh, to, to have been asked to, to be with you here today. And I understand that we have uh, some, a lot of listeners and, and, and watchers. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I, I want to mention that uh, Iceland has a long standing history with Fulbright uh, since 1957, actually. And uh, it has always been a, one of the cornerstones of the bilateral relations between the US and Iceland. And, and so many young people have had the opportunity to come to the United States and study. 
And uh, I think it, even if it was very special, you know, in the 60s and the 70s when people really didn't travel and, and that was maybe studying abroad was the way to get to know other cultures and, and societies. But I think it's also very important today. And I think the role that Fulbright plays, I mean, uh, in my view, this contrib contribution to the important aspect of what we can call maybe the diplomacy of education. And the, the people who do study abroad, they come home with an experience, with lifelong friendships and enhanced understanding of other people and cultures. And I, I think that's really important. And here Fulbright plays, plays such an essential role. And, and we in Iceland are very grateful for, for all the Fulbright uh, uh, scholars that we have or the grants we have received. And I understand since, the 90, since 1957, 1500. So that's a lot. And I also understand that a group of United States teachers is coming to Iceland um, on Fulbright uh, to, to uh, study Iceland and to, we will have, they will have a meeting at the foreign ministry where I work uh, to hear more about Iceland's foreign policy and, um, and the Arctic policy. And I actually just came from a, a very um, interesting conference, which I opened uh, on Arctic issues. And the Arctic is playing a greater uh, role by the day. Um, I wanted to just so to make it a little more interesting for people to, to show you a few slides. And uh, so I'm going to try to share my screen here uh, so that uh, we can um, look at some pictures while I'm speaking. Uh, I really, uh, really look forward then after my briefing to hear Eva, who I see here is ready to, to uh, and, uh, uh, give us a, a great concert to uh, so kind of uh, supplement what I'm saying. So, so I just wanted to uh, give you an overview. Uh, we mentioned, you mentioned in your title that it would be history and culture and environment, and I'll try to, to uh, touch upon all of these. So I was talking about the Arctic, and when you look at this map and see where is Iceland, you can see that it's smack there in the north, you know, with Greenland and, and, and kind of in the middle between the US and, and Europe. Um, I just, these are just a few facts. It, this is something that is prepared by, inspired by Iceland. Uh, there it says that the Icelanders are 340,000, but as far as I understand, we are almost hitting the 370 roof. And a lot of this is uh, because of immigration. Uh, we have, um, immigration has been growing and I could say that maybe the largest group of immigrants is coming from Poland. Um, there are some other fun facts here about the uh, Iceland having the oldest parliament in the world, uh, established in nine, 930 AD. Uh, something about the names that some of you are familiar with, that the men are called son of their father and the, do and the, and the women daughters, Jonsdottir, Dottir, it has become quite famous these days, but, uh, but this is kind of just a few fun fact about Iceland. Um, uh, and also, this is also by inspired by Iceland talking about sheep and horses. Icelanders are, are very much a horse people. Um, a lot of people uh, have own horses, even those who live in Reykjavik. Um, we used to have, I mean, farming in Iceland used to be mostly about keeping sheep. This has uh, changed since then, since in the old days, but this was very much the case. And, and for us, lamb meat is, is, the, is the staple meat in Iceland. And, and it was just, it's not that long ago that we were introduced to chicken and, and other, other meat. Uh, uh, but, uh, and then I also wanted to mention that uh, it says here that we have 170 geothermal pools in Iceland. And the pools is kind of a very stable cultural element in Iceland. It's very important for people to be able to go swimming or, or sitting in the hot tops. And, and this is where uh, politics is discussed and, and, and where, 
you relax after a long day at work. So it's a very important aspect of our culture. Um, if I just mentioned geology and fauna, flora and fauna, uh, one of the things that is very much an element in Iceland is that we are situated between two tectonic plates, the Eurasia one and the American one. And Iceland, you can say, is practically uh, move to the two plates are moving away from each other, which is what uh, explains the great volcanic activity in Iceland. And, and you may know that as we speak, there is a volcanic eruption in Iceland. And I will show you a picture of that, which is very close to the international airport and um, close to what many of you know from Iceland, the Blue Lagoon. But it's not uh, uh, it's not uh, dangerous, but it has become the greatest tourist attraction in Iceland these days. And maybe I can mention that uh, that U.S. citizen, fully vaccinated U.S. citizen, can now travel to Iceland. And actually, the first Delta plane landed this week uh, with with many tourists. So, what is kind of very uh, you know typical of Iceland is these uh, volcanoes, the geothermal energy that we have, the glaciers, the hydropower. Um, animals are the only wild animal in Iceland when the settlers came was the Arctic, Arctic fox. Uh, vegetation in Iceland is grassland, moss, lava sands, highlands and glaciers. And I'll just give you a few examples of these very typical aspects of Iceland. See here uh, a fjord in the east. Uh, this is very much Icelandic. Um, it's moss in a lava field. Moss is the first thing that grows in the lava, but it stays very rough and black uh, for, for centuries. But the, the moss is the first thing that grows. This is very much typical of the sands of, and then the glaciers, of course. Waterfalls is what is very much uh, something that people come to see in Iceland. And of course, the swimming pool I was mentioning. Uh, this one is actually close to where I live, but every part of uh, Reykjavik, every village, every small town has their own uh, swimming pool. And this is a recent picture of the volcanic eruption uh, close to Reykjavik. It's been very spectacular. And I think most people I know have sent me a selfie of themselves. Uh, at the volcano eruption. Uh, it's, been, it's been something that has been in the news here. Uh, I saw a clip from Good Morning um, America where um, a reporter had been there. So it has been a, a very interesting, interesting uh, experience. And because it's not dangerous, it's more a spectacular uh, sight. Uh, we mentioned history and you mentioned, Jay, that you went to the museum where you could see um, uh, some historical uh, facts about Iceland and the settling. Uh, I mean, the first settlers, uh, we usually in school, and I'm sure Eva remembers, we always said that the first settler came in 874, but that seems to be, this This number is is not so fixed these days and it's possible that the first Vikings even came earlier in the 6th century but but the the 9th century is is when we say that there was a permanent uh, settlement in Iceland the Althingi I mentioned the parliament was established in 930 and Christianity in 1000 sorry um the sagas, you mentioned the sagas also, Jay, and that is a very important aspect of our culture. That is where we, this is kind of our cultural identity is the sagas and our language. Those of you who have been to Iceland know that it's not, you do not see huge cathedrals or old universities or old uh, monuments, but what we have is the sagas that were written in the 12th, 13th century and we have our language. And it's very important for us to, to keep the language. Um, we were part of the Kingdom of Norway from 1262, and then we were part of Denmark. Um, but uh, I don't think I need to go so much into that, but 
kind of the birth of our nation started in the late 19th century, as many countries in, in Europe. Um, and we received the constitution from the Danish king in 1874, home rule in nine, 1904, became sovereign in 1918. Then the war, the World War II, um, brought the British to our shores and a year after uh, the US um, military. With, and because it, it goes to show how important the strategic uh, situation or the strategic location of Iceland in the middle of the Atlantic is, um, uh, for in, is and was in the war. Um, we, uh, I, I want to say that because the Americans came in 1941, uh, diplomatic ties were established. So we are now this year uh, celebrating 80 years of diplomatic ties and 70 years since we finalized a bilateral defense agreement uh, with the US, which is still, still valid. Um, many of you have heard of Vigdis Fimpoadottir, who was elected president in 1980, the first uh, women to become president in the world. And uh, it meant a huge, uh, it was a very important milestone for Iceland. It put Iceland on the map, you could say, uh, worldwide. But it was also very important for women and girls in Iceland because Vigdis was a role model. And most women do think of her when they think of someone that they looked up to and thought they could become someone when they were growing up. And she is still going strong. She is in her 90s and is still a prominent uh, figure in, in Iceland. Many of you have, of course, heard about the meeting between Reagan and Gorbachev in Iceland uh, that uh, marked the beginning of the end of the Cold War. That was in 1986. And, and we put there a very nice picture of Reagan and, and President Vigdis Fimbaudotir. Um, milestones in our history is also that in 1994, we became part of something called the EA agreement, which is a very comprehensive uh, trade agreement between Iceland, Norway and Liechtenstein and the European Union. Um, in 2006, the United States closed its Navy base in Iceland since the Cold War was over and, and the imminent threats that we see now in the high north were not there. The focus of the US was elsewhere. Uh, in 2008, uh, we had the economic crash. Uh, there was also an economic crash here. And, and from these, uh, a new economy was built. Uh, we recovered quite uh, fast and, and well. And there was a lot of uh, focus on free trade and trade agreements uh, across, um, across the world, which um, did uh, help us get out of this uh, enormous, it was more than a crash. It was, as it was really uh, very dramatic uh, in our history. And we are still, um, we are still um, recuperating from, from that. Um, I mentioned that we had an agreement with the European Union, which also means that we are not part of uh, the European Union, but we are a member of EFTA and the EA agreement that I mentioned. And uh, Jay, you mentioned in the beginning that I was Deputy Secretary General of EFTA, and the main task of EFTA is actually one, uh, to negotiate free trade agreements around the world, and two, to um, work on, on the many uh, issues that we work very closely with, with, the, with the European Union. But still, the United States is our biggest trading partner. Uh, and uh, one of the most important tasks of our embassy here in Washington is to ensure that this trade goes smoothly, that uh, we, try, we discuss with the US government on how to make sure that uh, we, we um, any hindrances to this trade uh, and uh, how we can kind of build uh, more relations, economically speaking. We have very uh, close ties with USTR. We have regular um, dialogues with the 
uh, State Department in the United States on economic issues, amongst them uh, economic empowerment of women, which is very important for us. Um, we are a founding member of NATO in 1949, and I did in the beginning mention the Arctic. We have been chairing the Arctic Council for the last two years. We are now giving uh, the chair over to our friends in Russia. And this will actually happen in a meeting that will take place in Reykjavik later this month. This is a ministerial meeting of the Arctic Council of the eight Arctic Council states, amongst them the United States, Canada, Russia, all the Nordics. And uh, this will be the first time that the new Secretary of State, uh, Blinken, will come to Iceland. And it's possible that in Iceland, he will have his first bilateral meeting uh, with his colleague from Russia, Lavrov. But this is still to, still to be seen and, and still in uh, being prepared. But we are very excited to have the US participating in this meeting. And do we think this underlines the growing importance that the US attaches to the Arctic, which in our view is very important. Climate change is one issue, but there are other issues that we need to deal with together in the high north. Uh, we uh, had a seat at the UN Human Rights Council. Um, and actually, uh, it was when the US decided to leave the council that we took the, the seat of the US. And this was a very uh, important experience for us, but we do applaud the new government for coming back to the Council, which we think is a very important forum for discussing human rights issues. So if I turn to the economy, fisheries used to be the kind of the mainstay of our economy, but tourism um, before the pandemic had uh, outgrown uh, fisheries as the most important industry in Iceland. But fisheries is still very important. And because of fisheries, the marine environment is important to us. And uh, one of the issues that we have been stressing worldwide is that we need to have healthy oceans. And plastic pollution is one of the issues that we have been tackling with other countries because this is really um, detrimental to uh, the marine life. Um, many of you have uh, know that we have, uh, have been blessed with uh, having uh, abundance of natural resources in hydro and geothermal power. So this means that all our houses are heated and all our electricity comes from these natural sources. That does not mean that we do not need to do our share in um, fighting um, the climate change that we're all facing now. And we are looking into ways to deal with this with, with green energy, uh, for example, also by um, we are trying to find ways to tackle the climate change um, by moving into, for example, um, using uh, electric cars by uh, trying to um, catch the carbon. And, and uh, we have developed a carbon capture and storage solution called CarbFix, uh, which actually turns uh, carbon dioxide into minerals in basaltic rocks. And, and this apparently has enormous capacity. So this is something that we are very much uh, uh, looking into and developing uh, and using resources um, to, to develop. Um, but we are also looking at how to uh, avoid using fossil fuels in transport. I mentioned cars, but uh, this is also an issue for fisheries and agriculture. We actually plan to be carbon neutral by um, 2040. Um, and um, we are working and the government is working hard to reach this aim. And we, of course, see now opportunities to cooperate with the new administration in, in Washington, which has certainly put uh, the climate crisis on the agenda, which we think is, is very important. Uh, there is a lot of innovation 
uh, in Iceland in many sectors, not just in the green energy sector, but also in the health sector. Um, life sciences is becoming a key sector and, and knowledge-based industries. But I mentioned Ambassador, Times when I my sorry my my headphones have a life of their own. Sometimes when I'm in the middle of something, a woman comes into my ear and says, "Battery high," so and then I'm closed off of speaking. So I'm I'm quite sorry for that. But I was talking about the importance of tourism. Tourism, as I said, had was becoming the most important uh, industry in Iceland. I can just mention that before the pandemic hit. Uh, we had about 700,000 U.S. tourists coming every year. And uh, we had 18 destinations for daily flights uh, from Iceland to the U.S. And in what you could say overnight, 90% of these flights were canceled. No tourists came. And this had detrimental effects on our economy, as you can imagine. But now things seem to be um, uh, getting better. There's light at the end of the tunnel and uh, US tourists are returning to Iceland. And we do hope that, uh, that we will be able to have at least 700,000 tourists in the next years. But it's, it's very, very important for us. Um, I was just going to turn to culture, but there Eva, of course, is stronger than I. So if you do have any very particular culture question, please, please uh, talk to her. But I just want to, wanted to mention literature, which is very important for us. I mentioned the sagas, part of our identity as a nation, uh, music, film and performing arts and visual arts. And of course, uh, as an island, we have been very much influenced by the United States, but also from Europe. And, and we have, I think, had the luck that our young people have gone abroad to study. And then they have brought these influences back home. And this has enriched our culture enormously. Uh, if I turn first to literature, because that's kind of the basis of our culture, you could say. I mean, I, we mentioned the Sarkas. Uh, we have one Nobel Prize uh, author, uh, Laxness. Some of you may have read some uh, books by him. Now, actually, what is most uh, popular abroad when it comes to Icelandic literature, it's, it's crime novels, the Nordic Noir. So Irsa and Arnaldur are two names that have been very popular. I'm having an event uh, shortly with a, with a young crime novelist called Ragnar Jonasson, who is being published now in the US. But books are a part of our culture. Reading is a part of our culture. And there is a, a, a phenomenon called the Christmas book flood. And that means that most books published are published just before Christmas because the most uh, popular gift at Christmas is a book. There is no Christmas without new books. So books is kind of what is discussed in the weeks um, uh, up to Christmas. People are asking each other, did you, have you read the latest from him or her? And so it's a big uh, part of our culture, the Christmas book flood. Um, so, um, but we, of course, uh, we are not immune to the problems other cultures are facing with, with young kids not reading enough, especially boys. Boys seem to be a particular problem here, but a lot of uh, action is being taken to, to, to help children discover the, the, um, the satisfaction and the adventure that is in reading books. 
Uh, music here, we're in Eva's turn, but uh, some of you have probably heard of Björk, of Monsters and Men, of Carlo, Kaleo, which is, be, is very popular in the US these days, Hildur Guðnadóttir, who the, has won many prizes for her music in Joker and Chernobyl. Viking Olafsson is a pianist who is, is, is becoming very famous around the world. Anna Thorvaldsdóttir, a composer who has been noticed here in the US. And uh, I think music is something that is some very easily connects cultures and countries, and it's the language of young people. Uh, I mean, these days, I when I hear music, I, I am not even sure if it's Icelandic. It's such a global, universal language and, and industry that that uh, a lot of our, our young uh, artists and musicians are very, uh, very much working abroad. Uh, film, film is a growing industry in Iceland. Um, we uh, are producing more and more films in Iceland, a lot of uh, TV programs, uh, but uh, very important aspect of the film industry in Iceland and which is something that is important for those people in Iceland who are working um, in film is that so many US films and uh, TV programs have been shot in Iceland and that is of course a very good way um, to this provides jobs for the people in the industry uh, but it's also a, a very good ad advertisement uh, for Iceland. I mean, Game of Thrones, everyone knows. Uh, many of you may have heard of uh, a series which became very popular uh, in in the US called Trapped. And there are more series being, being uh, produced. Uh, I have the feeling that uh, that the, the, the English speaking market is much more open to uh, films and, and TV dramas in other languages than English than used to be the case. And I, I think that's very positive. And that has also uh, um, created a lot of opportunities for our people in, in that, uh, in that uh, industry. Uh, visual art, of course. Um, we are we of we of course try to claim ownership over everyone who becomes famous and is is um, if we can trace their relatives to Iceland then Oliver Eliasson is probably the one of the biggest names in the art world these days and his parents are Icelandic but I know that he himself looks at himself as as Icelandic Danish German whatever but we are very proud of having um, him as being one of uh, of Icelandic descent. Um, Kjartan Ragnarsson is, is an artist that has also uh, had shows in, in, uh, in the US, in, in New York, for example. And the same goes for uh, artists calling herself shoplifter. Um, I have here a picture from a, a photographer called Rax, who has had two big shows recently in, in the US, in the Nordic Museum in Seattle, and is going to be uh, on display in Maine shortly. This is just kind of a very short insight into Iceland. I mean, there are so many things that we could discuss, uh, which have to do uh, with our culture, with our history. Um, but I would just like to invite you to ask questions on anything. It doesn't have to be anything of what I touched upon in, in my very uh, introductory uh, briefing, but I would be very happy to answer questions. Thank you. Jay, you're muted. We can't hear you. You still are. <laughs> yes, well, thank you very much, Your Excellency, for an excellent presentation on Iceland's history, culture, and environment. We will take the Q&A after Eva present the concert, if it is agreeable to you, Your Excellency. Of course. Yeah. Now, Eva comes from a classical 
by um, of course family and she is an animator and composer and she learned violin at an early age and gained attention and recognition for outstanding musical talent including beautiful tone and artistic interpretation. She has held numerous solo recitals in well-known concert halls, including Iceland, Japan, USA, Russia, and Europe. Some of the most known concert halls include Carnegie Hall, Trinity Church in New York City, and Carcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. She has premiered over 100 contemporary pieces for solo violin and received grant for NYWC, NYWC for her performances in 2014. She has composed several pieces for violin that reflect her home country, Iceland. It is with great pleasure I present to you Eva Ingelstadter. Hello? Can you hear me? Good, good, good. Yeah, yes, I can hear you. Okay, so um, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I, um, this is my first performance after COVID and I actually, during COVID, I had to take my violin to be restored. It's a very old violin, 1730. And uh, <clears throat> at the same time, the man who restored my violin created a new one exact copy of my violin. So today I want to start the first pieces of the program, which are from the collection of Reverend Bjarni Thorstensson. He um, collected music from all over the country. And uh, the ones that I chose here today are hymns. And uh, I find them very, very beautiful. So I'm going to start with three hymns from uh, Iceland on this new instrument. And for the rest of the program, which has been composed for me mostly about Iceland, um, I will use my other instrument. Thank you.
somehow I'm going to play um, a work that was written for me about Iceland. It's called Elf Dance by Martin Bonk. A humorous little piece. Oh, wait, wait, wait. First, uh, first I'm going to play the Frost Vapors, which is about the weather. A little bit of light by Rain Worthington. Dance of the Elves.
much. Um, the next piece is called Raven Thoughts. Um, we feel that the raven symbolizes Nordic emergence of consciousness. It's very important in poetry, literature, and uh, in this particular piece, he hints at a melody that's very well known in Iceland about the raven. of the first movement is danger. Thank you. 
next movement is called loss. movement is called survival. Let's see if I can find it. Oh. This one is called flight.
last movement is called Survivor. going to be a video with my uh, videos and uh, my performance of my own music. Thank you so much. Bravo, Eva. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Now, Her Excellency Rekha Smirkenyi 
will take Q&A discussion. Now, Your Excellency Reka. Thank you, Jay, and thank you, Eva, so much for this wonderful presentation. It is really uplifting and a fantastic way to get to know not just, you know, one culture, but a whole world behind it. So I, I really very much appreciate it. I think it's a very special bonus for all of us to be able to um, uh, have you uh, at our event today. And I would like to also thank you very much, Madam Ambassador Alastotir, because I think, you know, that background that you gave to us and that overview of the history and culture and you know, many of the fun facts and many of the attractions to, uh, uh, of Iceland has really given a lot of our audience as well uh, immediate um, uh, reaction to want to go and, um, and stay there. And of course, it is a fantastic opportunity to have you here to, uh, to, to uh, uh, go more in depth and tackle the questions that we have had. Some, uh, we have quite a number of questions and are, they are all fantastic. So um, without further ado, let me jump right into them and start um, with one, maybe right um, back to the practical realities that we are having um, uh, to face in all of our countries. Uh, one of the first ones was, but since we're having questions, I would like to um, keep them really short. So um, uh, one of the first questions that we had was, um, what are the principal challenges that uh, Iceland faces post COVID? And to Madam Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you also, Eva, for this wonderful music. It really, mm -hmm. ah, God, it's, uh, I'm a different person now. You know, I will go <laughs> smiling into the rest of my day. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, uh, I mean, the challenge is, of course, like with other, all other countries. I mean, getting back to normal is the challenge. And for us, getting back to normal is to be able to open the borders to tourists because that becomes such a vital part of our economy. But, uh, but at the same time, we need to protect our people from the pandemic. And it, it has been the case that as soon as you loosen up and open, uh, the cases grow. And we have not been as fortunate uh, as you here in the US that vaccination is much, much lower. So uh, we do, I mean, most people, say plus 40, 50 plus will be having their first vaccination by summer, but it will probably be fall before um, many of those will get their second shot. So, 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 so it's twofold. It's getting things into, back to normal to, uh, we need to build our economy back up uh, and, and uh, we need to protect people from the pandemic. Thank you so much. Yeah, it is really uh, a top priority for um, all governments to really protect their people and get back the economy on track. So thank you. Uh, another question that is uh, also fascinating is coming from Rifat Mursadin, um, says, saying, thank you, Madam Ambassador, for your time. Uh, Rifat is a Fulbrighter from the US and did her grant in Malaysia. She's actually planning to visit Iceland at the end of this month. So this is a very timely event for, uh, for Rifat. Um, and is asking if um, you could please elaborate on the role of immigration in Iceland, how you see this in particular in the context of diversity. I mean, uh, we, Eva remembers this, when we were growing up, uh, Iceland was very <laughs> monotonous. I mean, there were more or less just Icelanders there. Uh, but, but diversity has grown and we are now, per definition, a multicultural society, which is really something that uh, but we cherish and it's important for, for um, not just the economy, but just uh, for life in Iceland and, and, and for our culture in, in particular. Um, we have, I mean, I mentioned that the biggest group of immigrants comes from Poland and a lot of this has to do with a very huge growth of, of the economy, um, especially tourism. I mean, with tourism, with, with millions of people coming every year, we needed a lot of new hands on deck. 
uh, but we are also in the building sector and other sectors, fishery sectors, and so on and so forth. But we also have other people coming. We have, of course, uh, our uh, um, obligations when it comes to refugees, which we, of course, uh, take seriously. We have refugees from, from many countries of the world, many from Syria, for example, uh, lately, but also from other countries and from, from Africa. Uh, but then I've noticed that there is a growing um, interest um, in many other countries, for example, here in the US, especially young families who are interested in, uh, in moving to Iceland. And uh, I think it has to do with the people with young kids. I mean, they, they seek the security, the small society where you know people, you have, you know, a great network. If you can't pick your kid up at the kindergarten, you can phone your neighbor or what have you. We have affordable daycare, parental leave. So there are aspects which have, uh, in the last maybe 10 years or so, drawn a lot of people from the US, from Canada, from, from Europe um, to Iceland. And, and as I say, this just enriches our life and culture, and, and um, uh, at least in my view, and most people, uh, a very, very welcome development. Fascinating. It's so famous, uh, this system of support for, for the families and support for the people living there, that it is really making a very attractive, uh, shining example to many countries that unfortunately don't have uh, uh, such a system. Um, I also wanted to ask you briefly about what you mentioned about the Arctic Council that Iceland is uh, presiding now. And I wanted to ask you, I think it's a fascinating, uh, you know, new strategic and, you know, nature reserve and treasure of the earth, obviously, that we are very little aware of. But you have a country that is all its territory, the only country in the Arctic Council, that in the entire territory and its uh, seas or waters uh, are part of the, um, the Arctic. Can you tell us a little bit? Uh, how you see the, uh, the the role of the Arctic Council? Does it serve its purpose? Should it be, um, uh, should other committees be added? Is there, are there activities that are not included in the, in the, in the uh, scope now? Uh, especially as we hear daily, you know, more Russian increased activities in the, in the Arctic and more malign, or who knows, I mean, less of cooperation and more tension increasing around it. So I think it's going to be becoming increasingly the center of, uh, of uh, strategic discussions as well. Yes, thank you. I mean, the Arctic Council, one of the aims with our uh, chairmanship was to make the Arctic Council stronger. But that does not mean that we think the Arctic Council is the right forum to discuss security issues, which you mentioned. I mean, uh, and uh, uh, so, but the, for us, the Arctic Council serves uh, very well its purpose. It's, it's 25 years old this year, and uh, we've, it should focus on the needs of the people in the area. It should focus on sustainability, be it sustainable economy, sustainable environment, sustainable use of resources. I mean, that should be its focus and, of course, the most important issue is science, because everything we do in the Arctic must be science-based. The other issue, the strategic importance and the, and the security issues that we're facing, um, this we need to discuss. Um, it's, it's been discussed at NATO. NATO is shifting its focus a, a little bit to the north, to the high north. Uh, so. So we, we need to find ways to deal with that. And this is, of course, uh, I mentioned in my briefing that in 2006, the, the US uh, military base was closed down in Iceland. But recently, in, t in the last 10, 15 years or so, the, because of the enhanced activity in the area, um, there is a lot more focus by our allies, by the US in the area. So we have you know, air policing with participation of, of all, most NATO countries uh, and um, much more cooperation and coordination around the area. Thank you so much. Fascinating. And maybe <clears throat> uh, a last question, which um, 
probably should be addressed to both you and Eva because I think it's a fantastic representation of your country of an uh, and of an issue that I'm fascinated about. Um, as I was, I'm a security policy person. Okay, so I was reading the uh, the national security document of Iceland, and I was really struck by you know how much emphasis is even in a security policy document. I mean, even in 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 my Central European experience, uh, the emphasis is so clear and strong about the role of women in the society and in peace and security and negotiating. But I think overall in society, in in society and culture, um, you are both fantastic representatives of of successful, hardworking, um, very impactful women. How do you see this? Um, is there a special, I don't know, experience or message that you would like to? Uh, the world to know about Iceland or about your own experience that is helpful for younger women to um, uh, when they start their career either in music or in, in in politics how do you see that was there any special difficulty at the beginning that you had to face or or was there enough of a, of a social and and structural support that you could rely on oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, in my Eva, case, yes. <laughs> in my case, um, I really think we get a lot of support just from the sagas. We have a strong women personalities, characters that uh, give us the hint that we can do anything we want. But um, no, I always felt a good support within my field, what I was doing. Bergdís. Yeah, wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's little to add, uh, but I, I think, I mean, we have, uh, I mean, the, it's, a, it's a very complex question, actually, <laughs> but uh, I think um, by, I mean, you need to be stressing this issue all the time. You need to be stressing the importance of women being at the table, and because you were talking about security issue, we all know all the evidence is there. If the people, are, if the women are not at the table when there is negotiations on peace or stability or whatever, you know, it's not lasting. You know, have to include them. And we have 1325 from the UN uh, Security Council, which is very important, which is something that we have stressed in our foreign policy. And we also stress, I mean, you could say that gender equality um, is a red threat in all policy making in Iceland, be it internally or internationally. Fantastic, absolutely wonderful. Um, I don't know, as I was listening to this concert, you know, I really felt just as you say, it fills your heart with, you know, so smiling and it's a really uplifting uh, music, especially to see some of these very old and, and deeply rooted Mm -hmm. texts and messages and 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 music uh, maybe one last last question if i can add <laughs> because I just can't help uh, uh asking i don't know if jay wants to add something or ask a question also but my i my i would be very interested you know how you manage to find the, the or the music is modern and the text is old or is there a way of 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 describing the the notes as well um, so how how did you find these and how do you, um, well, you, you go back to these roots? In Iceland, singing is very, very important. We have choirs like almost in every uh, profession. But um, so this uh, reverend Bjarni Thorarinsson from Siglifjörður, he went around the country uh, 1906, I think, and he collected everything he possibly could just from what people were singing while uh, you know doing their work and uh, he would write this down so there is a book with um, all his uh, collection and uh, I, I think it has become more and more popular and I noticed that whenever I have one or two of these in my program people really respond to it so I find it fascinating. It's very beautiful. It is very, very special. You immediately feel in a different world. You enter history through this. Yeah. It's really yeah. very wonderful. Thank you. 
Well, maybe with this, I, uh, we can wrap up our discussion session and this wonderful presentation that we had. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Anastotter. It was really fantastic to have you. And we really hope to continue to remain in touch. This wonderful relationship that ISON has with Fulbright entitles to us to have a special tie with you as well here. So of course. please. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you so much also. Yes, Everybody thank you, Ambassador. For the wonderful program. And thank, thank you, Eva, you. also for this okay. wonderful, wonderful concert. It's extremely it's special to all of thank us. You so and it was thank really you very much enjoyed it incredible enrichment and thank you jay for keeping so much in your oh, heart this pleasure. wonderful bringing this yeah. wonderful event to all of us it, it yeah, was really very special incredible and our excellency ambassador and Eva engelstaff is so much uh, in terms of the talent in terms of, of, of the capacity it's enormous uh, presentation and insight thank you so much thank you thank, thank, thank you. you very much bye bye, yeah. bye, -bye. thank bye. you Thank you to the Fulbright Association members and donors who make our programming possible. Please look forward to our upcoming Fulbright Forums, Fighting Human Trafficking on May 11th, and a music concert on May 27th. You can check out all the details at fulbright.org calendar. And we are going to leave you with some videos of music by Ava. Have a great day.